We'll hear argument next in case 2011-99, Students for Fair Admissions versus the President and Fellows of Harvard College. Mr. Norris. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. Grutter assumed that universities could use race in a narrowly tailored way if they just did it like Harvard. But this court never had any evidence about Harvard. Now you do, and that evidence proves that none of Grutter's core assumptions were ever true. First, Grutter assumed that race would only be a plus. But race is a minus for Asians, a group that continues to face immense racial discrimination in this country. Asians should be getting into Harvard more than whites, but they don't because Harvard gives them significantly lower personal ratings. Harvard ranks Asians less likable, confident, and kind, even though the alumni who actually meet them disagree. What Harvard is doing to Asians, like what it was doing to Jews in the 1920s, is shameful, but it's a predictable result of letting universities use race in highly subjective processes. Second, Grutter assumed that applicants would be treated as individuals, not as members of racial groups. But Harvard gives racial preferences based on the box that applicants check, even if they never write about race or explain how it influences their views. And for competitive applicants, checking the right racial box is an anvil on the admission scale, worth the same as ultra-rare achievements like winning a national championship. Third, Grutter assumed that universities would seriously consider race-neutral alternatives, but Harvard never once did so until 2017, three years after we sued it. Harvard now refuses to eliminate its legacy preferences or boost its socioeconomic preferences, even though both changes would make Harvard far less white, wealthy, and privileged. That's how Harvard uses race, and Harvard is supposed to be the model. This court should admit that it was wrong about Harvard, wrong about Grutter, and wrong about letting the poison of racial classifications seep back into education. Grutter should be overruled both for public schools and for private schools that accept federal funds. Um, Mr. Norris, would you um, <clears throat> spend a few minutes, uh, some time on uh, the originalism argument that was made at the last, the end of the last case? Absolutely. So in terms of the original meaning of the 14th Amendment, the best source on this I've ever read is the United States brief on re-argument in Brown. It painstakingly details the legislative history and how the framers of the 14th Amendment saw it as a ban on all racial classifications. Uh, also, the, everyone knows that the impetus for the 14th Amendment was to constitutionalize the Civil Rights Act of 1866. The Civil Rights Act of 1866 is a series of bans on racial uh, discrimination. It's a series of colorblind measures and requirements. And then the, one of the earliest uh, cases this court had before it went off the rails in Plessy was a case called Strouder, where the court immediately recognized that the purpose of this amendment was to eliminate racial classifications, no matter whether they benefited uh, whites or blacks, because racial classifications themselves impose harms. That's the affirmative evidence. Now, I know that the, the, the evidence, the pushback is the, the post-ratification history, um, but the post-ratification of the history of the 14th Amendment is not the best evidence because we know there was massive resistance to the original meaning of the text of the 14th Amendment, but it also doesn't prove anything. Every measure that's cited in Harvard's brief was a remedial measure. It was in response to the end of slavery and the position that black Americans found themselves in. Harvard does not cite a remedial measure for what it's doing today. Those same measures that it cites would not be constitutional today because they would no longer serve a remedial purpose and not a shred of evidence that, that anyone back then used race to achieve the educational benefits of diversity. Would you have any objection uh, uh, if you do not ask can, uh, candidates for admission to, to uh, check a box uh, what their race is, but you are allowed to take into consideration what an applicant would say in, a, in an essay about uh, um, having to confront discrimination uh, growing up and how he or she did that. You are allowed to take in consideration what a faculty recommender said. You know, one of the things that, you know, this applicant uh, would bring is uh, uh, how to uh, deal with uh, racial uh, discrimination uh, in an area or in a school where it's, it, 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 he's part of a very small minority. Um, is there any do you have any objection to that sort of introduction of, of race on behalf of a particular applicant? Absolutely not, uh, Mr. Chief Justice. And in fact, at the end of this case, at the end of the trial, it was, it was, we, were, we discovered that Harvard had amended its reading procedures for applications. And there had been an amendment that said, you only should take into account race if someone talks about it on their essay or in their, in their recommendation letters. Harvard deleted that instruction and said, that is not how we use race, and that should have never been put in there. So we really are, in this case, talking about the checkbox. 
So you agree that um, with respect to the essays, um, I mean, the Chief Justice suggested that one aspect of racial experience is confronting discrimination, but there are also other aspects of racial experience. Justice Alito gave an example earlier. Um, but you agree that with respect to the essays, whether it's guidance counselors or whether it's students, can, um, can express whatever uh, views they choose to express about um, their own racial experiences and the relevance of that for admissions officers? Yes. The, the, what, what Title VI bans is race itself as a consideration. And so if a university gives credit to a black student who writes an essay about overcoming discrimination and equal credit to an Asian student who writes an essay about overcoming discrimination, then that is not race itself. But that is over... Oh, sorry. Finish. Uh, so say that, that, that's overcoming discrimination, which Justice Scalia wrote in Croson is not a racial classification. But I guess, you know, in our earlier argument, Justice Kagan pointed out that this gets to be slicing the salami pretty finely. I mean, it's one thing to say, yes, that shows resilience because you've written about overcoming discrimination. And, and a student could write about any number of obstacles that they've overcome from physical disabilities on down the line. But what if, you know, Justice Jackson had asked in the last argument, um, you know, about pride. What if, what if an applicant wrote an essay about how integral their racial identity was to them as a source of pride and um, the cultural uh, attributes of the racial heritage were very important? Would that be okay, even if it were all intimately tied up, say, with you know the traditions of a Mexican family? And, and if the answer is no, that can't be extricated from race, why would that be different than someone writing about how important it was to them to have this passion for music in their life, that they loved music? I think culture, tradition, heritage are all uh, not off limits for students to talk about and for universities to consider. They can't consider that. They can't read that and say, oh, this person is Hispanic or black or Asian, and therefore I'm going to credit that. They need to credit something in unique and individual in what they actually wrote, not race itself. I, I'm, I'm a little confused because this almost sounds like a different kind of viewpoint discrimination. <laughs> and under our strict scrutiny standards, we're not supposed to discriminate on the basis of viewpoint or discriminate on the basis of religion. They're considered as sacrosanct, I believe, as race. And yet what you're suggesting is um, that uh, the viewpoint that somehow being a minority that overcomes discrimination in the way you define it as important, as overcoming obstacles, that that's okay. But if you're a black person who's from an affluent family, who may be the only class president ever in a white school's history, that that fact shouldn't feature. That's a form of viewpoint discrimination, isn't it? I don't think that we're saying- That that's not overcoming any kind of obstacle? Uh, we're not saying that universities have to consider anything or nothing. The universities just cannot consider race itself. But I thought you were saying that both of those essays might be entirely appropriate for the university to consider. Is that correct? Correct. Or did yeah. I there, misunderstand what you were saying? No, there is no federal statute about what essays uh, universities consider. There's a federal ban on consideration of race so, itself. So why is it? Are you just objecting to touching a box that admissions officers can look at? We're objecting to the use of race as either a plus or a minus in making it. But I don't think decisions. you, I think the district court made very clear findings <clears throat> that ch checking the box alone is not what got anybody in. That, that it a, was a holistic enterprise that looked at uh, everything that that candidate did and race might have been one among many factors. Because there's a lot of Hispanics and blacks who have higher, higher GPAs than so many whites who don't get admitted. So they're not looking at just being black and white. They're rejecting a lot of the, the 10 percent applicants who have higher numbers than, I guess, whites and Asian Americans. Uh, Your Honor, there's a finding from the district court in our favor at page 116 of the petition appendix that Harvard can award a racial preference based on the checkbox alone whether or not an applicant writes about it or otherwise indicates that it's important to them. Um, and that is important. That's race well, itself. That, that, that finding was made in, uh, in an undisputed finding by the district court 
that race alone did not account for any one admissions package, that it was race among many factors. Well, the district court found that race is determinative for 45 percent of blacks and Hispanics who get into Harvard. So, yes, there's 55 percent who would not get in. Uh, I'll let Mr. Waxman debate that, because that's not the way I saw that record. It was very clear that the district court found, for example, that being Asian or not being Asian wasn't involved statistically in any amount, in any of the admissions, whether for ADLCs or for non-ADLCs. Well, I just want to be clear. The 45 percent number is when race is determinative for blacks and Hispanics. That's the number of applicants who it's determinative for. Our number was much higher. That's not my number. That's Harvard's number in their race neutral alternatives report. Counsel, um, if I could return a moment to the drafting of the 14th Amendment. You uh, said we should ignore the post ratification history, but let's just pay a little attention to it for a moment. Um, <clears throat> in the briefs, we have discussion about the Freedmen's Bureau that, that, that Congress set up. How is that consistent or inconsistent with your position? I think it's entirely consistent, Your Honor. The Freedmen's Bureau, for the most part, did not draw any racial classifications. It was classifications on the basis of being a former slave or a refugee, and the refugees at the time from the Civil War were mostly white. Um, in fact, when, when objections were made in Congress that this is a racial-based uh, law, the, the people who supported the Freedmen's Bureau denied the charge. They didn't say yes, but so what? They said, no, it is not. It is not race-based at all. So today, uh, a benefit to descendants of slaves would not be race-based, correct? I, I think that's incorrect, Justice Kavanaugh. Well, how does that, you just said, uh, benefit to former <laughs> slaves was not race-based in the Freedmen's Bureau. How is that different uh, now? Well, the remedial exception that this court has recognized is, is fairly narrow. It has to be uh, prior. The question is whether it's race-based. You, right. okay. you said, you said, I think, to Justice Gorsuch, and I'm sorry to interrupt his question, but you said to Justice Gorsuch, I think, that the uh, benefit for former slaves was not race-based. That's correct. Then the benefit for descendants of former slaves is also not race-based. You can make other arguments if you want about that, but it does not seem to be race-based under what you said to Justice Gorsuch. Correct? Uh, not correct. I think there's a difference between uh, the former slaves themselves getting a benefit versus generations later. I think that's a, a classification on the basis of ancestry, which is still problematic under this court's precedence. Even if it's not directly race-based, I would assume that universities are, are and you, depend on the record, but universities are drawing that classification as a proxy for race in ways that the Reconstruction Congress was not. Okay, if I might just uh, finish up. The Freedmen's Bureau is on the federal side. Um, we have some briefs before us that also talk about practice on the state side. Now, we know that shortly after the Civil War, there were a lot of race-based statutes passed by states, and most of them were Jim Crow laws that invidiously discriminated on the basis of race. Uh, but uh, your friend on the other side cites two that he says are not, um, one from Kentucky and one from South Carolina. Could you address those? Yes. So we, we cite a book full of statutes from the same era from states that were purely colorblind. But they do cite two examples, one from South Carolina, which um, I believe banned racial discrimination uh, by government licensed entities. And there was a finding by that legislature that our government licensed ent entities were continuing to discriminate on the basis of race. I think it was a directly a remedial measure. It made sense in light of uh, you know, the end of the war and the massive racial discrimination that was still ongoing. Now, the Kentucky statute is even clearer. It gave benefits. Uh, it, it was a racial classification, but it gave benefits to a group of people in Mercer County, Kentucky, who had no property, uh, were so injured they could no longer work, had no income. I mean, I, mean, I think that what the statute was talking about were the people, the, the recently uh, freed slaves in Mercer County, to which there were many. And then I have one final question about this. Uh, there's also a question of whether we should pay attention to state practices uh, given the language of the 14th Amendment, which uh, doesn't pertain to or whether we should pay attention to the federal side, sorry, uh, given that the language of the 14th Amendment doesn't purport to bar remedial measures or classifications by Congress, which at that time was in full reconstruction efforts, but that the drafters of the 14th Amendment were especially concerned about racial uh, classifications at the state level because so many of them everyone knew would be used as Jim Crow laws were to discriminate against African Americans. I think there's something to that, Justice Gorsuch. Justice Scalia recounted some of that history, I think, in Croson and maybe Adirond, where he said uh, there's no reason to think that the same distrust of the federal government would have been there at the time. But I, I, I don't think any of these federal statutes are even particularly hard if you assume 
the Equal Protection Principle binds the federal government because they are all plainly remedial. None have anything to do with diversity, and Harvard has not pressed the remedial interest that justified those I'm statutes. I'm sorry, but many of the civil rights statutes and some of the laws pertaining thereto were directed to um, and directed to being equal to whites. So there was consciousness of race in those statutes. I, I, th I think not in a relevant sense. Uh, those statutes, this court said in the JAM case in 2019 that that exact language is colorblind, that whites, you have to have the same right, rights as whites, which means everyone is equal. Now, they used race-based language, but the race, well, what they did was they banned racial discrimination. So That's what not do we do about all the legislation that was passed that gave benefits not just to former slaves, but to free blacks? That was still remedial in your mind? Because I'm, there was inequality, correct? I, I believe it was. And it was in response to an entire system that had been built up of, of de jure discrimination. I think those were remedial statutes as well. And uh, so even, the even if we have de jure discrimination now or segregation now, Congress can't look at that? Because we certainly have de jure segregation. The races are treated very differently in our society in terms of their access to opportunity. I believe that the remedial exception is still good law. It was one of the two things that justifies the use of race and education that this court identified and parents involved. However, Harvard has not made that argument, has no factual record that you would need to support that argument. It does not justify its use of race based on its own prior discrimination against blacks and Hispanics. Are you aware of de jure segregation today? I am not. I am aware that uh, that racial preferences on college campuses, in our belief, in our view, have increased racial consciousness, and so there's some of this is happening on campus, but it's not. It's not de jure. It's not clear that there's segregation between there are large swaths of the country, with res residential segregation. There are large numbers of of schools in our country that have uh, people of just one race. There are schools, districts that have only kids of one race and not multiple race or not white people. Uh, de jour to me means places are segregated. The causes may be different, but places are segregated in our country. Absolutely. And I, and I think the top 10 percent program in Fisher, which really got a, a bad rap in Fisher, too, but was meant to, uh, solutions like that are meant to account for residential segregation in a race neutral way. Yeah. The that, problem is that they don't. That's what the district court found. Uh, my memory of Fisher, too, was that the top 10 percent program was extremely successful at increasing the enrollment of underrepresented minorities at Texas. Um, there are other solutions. We, ha we have a very sophisticated race-neutral alternative in this case that takes into account socioeconomic status and forces Harvard to eliminate its preferences for the largely white legacies. And that is another way. I mean, our numbers, the number of, his, of Asians would increase on campus. The number of Hispanics would increase on campus. The overall number of underrepresented minorities would increase on campus. Blacks wouldn't increase. Black representation would be 10 percent, which is higher than it is in the state of Massachusetts. And that number is, is quite low. Our expert testified that if Harvard was only willing to consider wealth instead of income, that that number would be quite a bit better, because the main disparities we see on the basis of race today is not on parental income, but on generational wealth. Well, Harvard, Harvard argues, though, that we have a compelling interest in diversity writ large, and that this court has deferred to that interest. And among the diverse things that we need to have in our class are children of large donors. There's evidence about that museum we talked about earlier, uh, um, children of legacies, and, and squash team. I, I, I'm not making it up. It's in the record. And um, to what extent should this court be deferring to those interests uh, as part of um, its compelling interest analysis? Uh, not at all, Your Honor. I, I, don't th I think strict scrutiny means you need to, con you need to be able to reject race-neutral alternatives because they don't satisfy the compelling interest, and the compelling interest is overall broad-based diversity, not declines in our, our fencing status, not drops in five points on the U.S. News and World Report, but it's diversity. And Harvard, it's, it's a little ironic in this case, Harvard is not diverse at all, um, besides its, its racial statistics. Nine percent of incoming freshmen at Harvard are conservatives. Um, Harvard is 82 percent wealthy. There's 23 rich students for every one uh, low-income student on campus. It is not diverse in hardly any other way. Um, and so I think that the compelling interest that you recognize in Grutter is not what's actually being pursued on Harvard. You heard the... Go ahead. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. I mean, are, are you saying now that there is an interest and a compelling interest in racial diversity among other kinds of diversity? Uh, 
I mean, putting Harvard's, you know, whether Harvard should be more socioeconomically diverse, uh, probably should be. Um, uh, but putting that, I mean, is there an interest in racial diversity? I agree with my colleague, not a compelling interest that could justify a racial classification. But racial diversity is not a bad thing. It is a great thing. Um, it well, is something but, but the whole premise of this, right, and, you know, we can talk about whether uh, these programs are narrowly tailored, whether the universities have done enough to, uh, in, in the, with the use of race-neutral criteria. But the premise of your argument is that even if race-neutral criteria could not achieve the object, Harvard can't use race-conscious criteria. And that must be because you think it's just not important enough. Isn't that right? I don't think that's right. So we have very detailed record evidence here that if Harvard just turned off race on its admissions process, it would still have 6% African Americans, I believe it's 9% Hispanics, so 15% underrepresented. So you think like good enough, but how about if it were 2%? I mean, the nature of your argument is that it doesn't matter. That's what the nature of your argument is. I disagree, Justice Kagan. It does matter because if you're below those numbers, then Harvard's probably discriminating in some sense, and it should stop. Or it's not reaching underrepresented minorities in the way that it should. Perhaps it should not. But that's just fighting the, the, the question. I mean, the question is, um, you know, is there a limit beyond which you would say, oh, yes, if, if you can't achieve that level of diversity with race-neutral criteria, then you're allowed to use race-conscious criteria. I, I don't think there's any level that justifies explicit racial classifications, but I, I'm going to fight the hypothetical one more time if you'll let me, because yeah, race no, neutral alternatives. No, I don't think I will. So let me just go on and ask you a couple of other things. I mean, I mean, because this is, a, you know, to me, this is a lot of the argument here is about a university has a, a, a compelling interest in collecting a diverse class, including along racial dimensions, and maybe especially along racial, racial dimensions given the kinds of challenges that our society faces in the exact same way that all the other institutions of our society does. So I'm just going to ask you some questions about that. If, 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 uh, if you're a hospital and you serve a diverse group of patients, is it super important to you to have a diverse set of doctors? Um. I, I don't know that the, that the evidence about the diversity of doctors and patients or anything about the medical field. It wouldn't sense. matter, yeah. Okay, or maybe it would, you don't know. If you're a police department and you serve a diverse community, is it super important to you to have a diverse set of police officers? I mean, I, I believe that's important if there's good evidence that, that, that a racial classification was needed. That has nothing to do with the educational benefits of diversity in universities. That's the interest that Grutter Do you upheld. think that uh, if you're a law firm or if you're a judge, if you're a judge and you want to have a diverse set of clerks, do you think a judge can't think about that in making clerkship decisions? Absolutely can think about it. Uh, this court's decision in Feeney says knowledge of race is not the violation. It is using it as a factor I'm to using, distinguish let's, let's say a judge says, I want a diverse set of clerks. That's, you know, I want clerks who would, you know, grade on every, any number of criteria, but I also want a diverse set of clerks. So over the years, people will look at that and they'll say, there are Asian Americans there, there are Hispanics there, there are African Americans there, as well as there are whites there. Can a judge not do that? I mean, I think that's a, that's a, that is an admirable goal. I don't think a judge could implement that goal by putting a thumb on the scale against Asian applicants or giving a big preference to black and Hispanic applicants. I think you need to treat people treat, uh, equally based on race, just as you're not going to hold my race against me in judging the quality of my arguments. I think race, uh, racial diversity is important because it's a good metric to make sure our, our, our institutions are equally open. And you can certainly be concerned about that. But the question is using racial classification, telling people that you didn't get the clerkship because of your race. Yeah, but the, the, the point here is, look, everybody would rather achieve all our racial diversity goals through race neutral means. Everybody would rather that. And that's certainly what our cases say you have to do. The question is, when the race neutral means don't get you there, are you prevented from taking race into account in all those ways that I said? And I could add a dozen more businesses who find it necessary, you know, in order to achieve their economic objectives to have racially diverse workforces. I mean, I could go on and on and on. And the question is, when race neutral means can't get you there, don't get you there, when you've tried and tried and they still won't get you there, can you go race conscious?
I don't believe so, Justice Kagan. And I think your, this court has already said in parents involved that racial diversity is not a compelling interest. It is the overall diversity of all kinds on college campuses. And I don't, I mean, this is not, this doesn't have to be hypothetical. We presented an alternative to Harvard that would achieve socioeconomic diversity for the first time, that would boost uh, underrepresented minority representation, that would lower the number of white students on campus. And so we're talking not about no diversity and diversity. We're talking about 10% black representation or 14% black that's representation. That's your, um, I would say, narrower argument. Uh, I think Justice Kagan's right that you have a broader argument that it wouldn't it wouldn't matter. Then you have a narrower argument, as I read the submission and hear you, that uh, even under the Bakke Grutter framework, race neutral alternatives suffice to achieve the, the kind of diver sufficient diversity. And I'm going to ask you the same question I asked the Solicitor General, which is how do you, how do you measure that on your narrower, as I see it, argument? Maybe you don't want to accept my characterization, but on what I see as your narrower argument, what what is sufficient? What's meaningful, to use the Solicitor General's words, in your view? Well, I think you need to be measuring, I mean, if you just take Grutter's interest as a given, you need to be measuring whether your student body is diverse on all dimensions. Um, I don't think Harvard now, is Now, let me ask it specifically. How do you know whether a race-neutral alternative proposed would be sufficient, adequate to achieve uh, sufficient levels of uh, otherwise underrepresented minorities that you would satisfy what Bakke and Grutter, which I know you disagree with, but would satisfy what those achieve. And you heard the Solicitor General's answer, and I'd be curious your responses to her or your alternative submission on that. Well, I think the burden is on Harvard, and so Harvard would need to come forward with evidence about race-neutral alternatives that have been presented or that it's considered itself and show how under that alternative it's not getting the educational benefits of diversity. Now, in this case, Harvard, the only testimony we have is that Harvard doesn't know what number it needs to get the educational benefits of diversity, doesn't know what evidence to consult to know whether it has that, doesn't know what the evidence would even look like, as Dean Fitzsimmons testified, and the only evidence is Harvard's report uh, on, on the importance of diversity. But, which but in looking, I'm sorry, looking at your proposals or looking at California or Michigan or Washington, one of the big themes I think of the brief is, hey, we have these states that have done race-neutral alternatives, and that's been, that's been effective in achieving diversity. I think you can uh, dispute that characterization, but that's a theme I, I gleaned from the briefs. And as I look at that, I want to know, well, what does that mean, effective or adequate? Uh, what, what's the measurement? Really the same question I had for the Solicitor General. It's, asking us to say, yes, that's adequate, but what is that? Got to say more than that, I think. Part of the problem, I think, is the fuzziness of the interest in Grutter itself. Um, but no, no, no. No. Accept the interest. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. Accepting that the interest, race neutral, this is the back half of your back part of your brief, race neutral alternatives are adequate. And I, I just want to know, okay, well, California, Florida, great. That's adequate because? Uh, the, and that could be translated to Harvard because? Yeah, the, the University of California system is the most racially diverse uh, elite institution in the world. Um, whites are the third most represented group on campus. So if racial diversity has these educational benefits and they've achieved them, um, I think they've, they study their undergraduates on your racial consciousness and your cross-racial understanding. They get really high scores at Berkeley. Berkeley and all the UC system tells prospective students that we have a very diverse student body and that, that the educational benefits were, uh, that you would expect to get from that are present. It's the top ranked public university in the country. It's your great. Your point then, the, the necessary add-on point is, and that could be translated to Harvard in essence or something I, sufficient could be translated to Harvard. And I just want you to fill in the blank there. Why? I think you can. Our, our race neutral alternative that we focused on, simulation D is what we called it, would make Harvard um, go, they would go from 82 percent economically advantaged to 51 percent. You would actually have pure socioeconomic diversity where it's about 50 50. Um, the number of white students would decrease, the number of Asian students would increase, the number of Hispanic students would increase. Um, I think you'd see lots of benefits in that. The number of black students would decrease from what to what? Would decrease from 14% to 10% was the number. And our expert testified that that number, 10% is an absolute floor because he only, the number couldn't be higher because his socioeconomic preference didn't have the sophisticated data that Harvard has. I think that's successful on, on any metric. And I, I've never heard Harvard prove the, the, the delta there as being uh, necessary for educational benefits of diversity. Council, 
I don't know what to do in a situation like this one. If you have perfect scores on every metric, you're not guaranteed a spot at Harvard because they have enough people with perfect scores of every background that exceeds their class limit. At some point, something has to break the tie. And as we know, um, top 10% students of Asian and uh, of black and Hispanic backgrounds in academic and extracurricular activities are not being admitted to Harvard. So it's not as if once we say, take race out of this, that all of the people who are, that you consider super qualified are gonna get in. But on every matrix, there's going to be competing applicants. And you're saying a school can't look at its general diversity figures and say, among equal applicants, I might make race a tiebreaker if the numbers that I have on that metrics seem fairly low. Otherwise, you're saying, no, you can't do that. No, you cannot do that. That's what Title VI forbids. And, it doesn't and that forbid basically it. what you're saying is really race diversity is not important. R so R I don't actually see why all the race base, because all of the alternatives, whether it's the 10% plan, whether it's socioeconomic, they're all subterfuges to recent reaching some sort of diversity in race. You're touting them as race neutral, but none of them are race neutral. You're doing them because you believe in racial diversity. I just don't understand why considering race as one factor, but not the sole factor, is any different than using any of those other matrix. Well, I don't think those are those are racial classifications in disguise. Uh, Harvard's never criticized Simulation D that we presented as a racial classification in disguise. It criticizes it because it doesn't hit Harvard's precise racial numbers. Um, it's based on socioeconomic status, and I don't think anyone thinks eliminating no, it, legacy. It, it reduces SAT scores, averages. It reduces um, lots of other factors to get to your numbers. I mean, I think that's our point, that, that the SAT scores would go from the 99th percentile to the 98th percentile. That's not sacrificing academic excellence. That's moving Harvard from Harvard to Dartmouth. Dartmouth is still a great school. That's that they get 98th percentile SAT scores. You've got to make <laughs> I, some I, I sacrifices. Don't, I, I there are those who love it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you, Counsel. Uh, Justice Thomas. <laughs> Justice Alito. Anything further? Justice Kagan. One question about the uh, how to think about the 25-year uh, sentence in uh, Grutter and the surrounding discussion. Yeah, absolutely. I think that what people forget about the 25-year mark were the four paragraphs you mentioned before it, where they explain that racial preferences, uh, they will fail their own acid test unless they make themselves unnecessary. So I think what Justice O'Connor was saying is that in 25 years, if we still need race, it's not that you get another 25 years, it's that we then declare racial preferences to be a failure and call it off and go to race, race neutrality and try that instead. Justice Barrett? But we're not to that 25 year point yet, right? So if, if it has its own self-destruct me mechanism where it says like, hey, Garter says we gotta call it quits because they're just not working, are we obligated to give? more time? Well, Harvard has certainly never indicated that in five years uh, it will stop using race. Harvard over the 20 year span has not decreased its use of race at all. And uh, I think the only legal standard this court has ever recognized for when do you stop using race in education is in Brown with, with all deliberate speed. The 25 year mark, we don't, you know, we don't support it from the get go. Um, but we do think there was a prediction from Justice O'Connor that is not borne out. And so Grutter on its own terms, I think 20 years is enough to call it. Thank you, counsel. Mr. Waxman? <clears throat> Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, the evidence and findings in this case confirm what this court has long recognized, that a university student body comprising a multiplicity of backgrounds, 
experiences, and interests vitally benefits our nation. Stereotypes are broken down. Prejudice is reduced, and critical thinking and problem-solving skills are improved. Student body diversity makes our businesses more innovative and globally competitive, our scientists more creative, our medical professionals more effective, and our military more cohesive. Experience has more than borne out Justice Powell's observation that our future as a country depends on having leaders who have enjoyed wide exposure to students as diverse as the nation itself. And so, as this court has consistently held, if necessary to achieve genuine diversity, a university need not blind itself to race, which, like the type of high school an applicant attended, their socioeconomic and family background, or the part of the country they live in, forms a part of who they are. Now, SFFA attempts to use Harvard's admissions program as some sort of proof that settled constitutional precedent is egregiously wrong. But while SFFA is fully entitled to its own legal arguments, it is not entitled to its own facts. Following exhaustive discovery in this case, the trial court considered the testimony of 30 witnesses and detailed expert analysis and made extensive, meticulous findings which the Court of Appeal robustly affirmed. And those findings, applying strict scrutiny, are that Harvard does not improperly emphasize race in its admissions decisions, it does not engage in racial balancing, it most certainly does not discriminate against Asian American applicants, and it does not yet have a current workable race-neutral alternative. The false narrative to which SFFA claim, clings is no basis to dismantle decades of precedent confirming the constitutionality of limited race consciousness in admissions. And I very much welcome the court's questions. Uh, Mr. Waxman, um, the petitioner uh, argues that over 80 percent, that actually you could, you do have available a, non, a race neutral uh, approach that would uh, yield different but excellent results. And um, the argument in, uh, includes uh, the fact that, at least as they argue, that you're over 80 percent wealthy students, that that's not uh, diverse and that over 30 percent or 30 percent or so of a class is uh, made up of ALDC uh, students. Um, and that if you were to lower those numbers, you could achieve um, far more diverse results without, uh, uh, along socioeconomic lines, and I don't think it's arguable that Harvard is socioeconomically diverse, but the, at least it doesn't appear that way. But uh, it seems that, and that would not have a constitutional uh, uh, problem if you did it socioeconomically. And I'd like you simply to address uh, their argument. Yes, thank you. First of all, the numbers that my friend is throwing around are not, in fact, the numbers that actually reflect, for example, socioeconomic diversity at Harvard, where, as it stands now, 20 percent of all matriculants pay nothing, 70 percent of underrepresented minorities pay nothing, and well over half of all applicants get substantial financial aid. But as to your point about race-neutral alternatives, and I correct me if I'm wrong, Justice Thomas, but I think this is what you're asking me about, we have exquisitely detailed metrics in this case with respect to race-neutral alternatives and findings and testimony. With respect to the so-called ALDCs, which is an acronym that I think I was present, I was actually literally present at the birth of, which is a preference for children of alumni, children of faculty and staff, athletes, and other people who have found themselves on the dean's interest list. This, the data in this case shows that if that, if race were eliminated, you couldn't consider race, and you also could give none of those preferences, the racial diversity of the matriculating class would go down. 
the, re the, the, the representation of African Americans, if you just stop considering race, would go from 14 to 6 percent. But if you also stop considering ALDCs, it would go to 5 percent. With respect to uh, let's uh, just say hy hypothetically, though, uh, hypothetically, and I, I know I'm going to get. I, I know all the usual caveats, all right, and all I right. accept them. Well, thank you, Mr. Yes, Waxman. Yes, I'm, I'm pretty thank sure you. since you're asking me, I'm not going to like. You're not going to like. It. <laughs> but let's assume that a very wealthy university could pay for everybody to go and still increase its endowment. It's a perpetual motion machine, Malcolm Gladwell called them. <laughs> Let's say it, 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 if it just gave up preferences for donors' children, legacies, and squash athletes, okay? Or maybe those who row crew, all of which tend to favor predominantly white children. And it could achieve whatever it deemed racial diversity, would it then be permitted to engage in race consciousness? Or in that circumstance, would you agree that it, uh, that would not be narrowly tailored? So I'm not claiming. I'm accepting your hypothetical as hard as it is for me in light of what the evidence I understand is, shows. There we go. I, I am not claiming that there is a compelling interest in having donors per se. There is a compelling interest in your proverbial art museum. There is a compelling There is a compelling interest in the art museum? No, no. no. This, these are the things that I'm not okay, claiming. Okay. okay? I'm, I'm just sorry. claiming all of those things. All right. When you look at a so-called race-neutral alternative, the question that this court, that Justice Powell articulated in Bakke and this court underscored and amplified in Grutter and then in Fisher is how does, is, does that race neutral alternative actually substantially impact the character of the institution and the education oh. that's being provided? Now, let and me here, stop you there because, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but surely getting rid of those preferences would substantially impact the university. And, but and you, you are, you're, you're saying they are not a compelling interest for constitutional purposes. So, no, what, I'm, sa what I'm saying. What does the 14th Amendment make? make legacy children of don't. course okay no so of, we agree of course not and the truth of the matter is that if this were a case in which the evidence showed that eliminating a legacy preference made a substantial difference the district judge who to say that the district judge was applying strict skeptical scrutiny on the narrow tailoring principles is quite an understatement, okay. might have decided otherwise. What the district court found, and uh, Judge oh, okay, Gorsuch, okay. if I can just sure. make one comment about the record, which I think responds to the, at least the gist and spirit of your hypothetical. With respect to race-neutral alternatives, the, the, the simulation, what has come to be called simulation D in this court, the district court found that quote, the simulation D would require, quote, sacrifices on almost every, every dimension important to Harvard's admissions process. Among other things, and these are all recited in the Smith Committee report, they are recited in the, the extensive discussion of race neutral alternatives in both the district court opinion and the court of appeals opinion, are that, for example, with respect to academic excellence, the academic factor, the number of, of matriculants with, who score one or two on the five-point scale would go down 17 percent. I'm familiar. There, Mr. Waxman, I am yeah. familiar with all of that along so in other words, We go down not, from 99 to 98th percentile. I, I've got it. If, no, I might, no. if I might shift gears. Okay. I, I, I'm familiar with all those, and I appreciate that, and I understand your point. It was a hypothetical. Um, what do we do about history here? Because one, one, of, one, one thing we, we know, or we think we know, or we're told in the briefs at least, is that Harvard's move to a holistic uh, application approach happened in the 1920s because it wanted to impose a quota on Jewish applicants, but it didn't want to do through front door. So it used diversity as a, as a subterfuge for racial quotas. What the record in this case shows, and it's, it's discussed in some detail in the, I'm going to blank on the names of the reports, but the various reports that Harvard has done over the years on diversity and diverse admissions in the case, one is the so-called Rudenstein report and the other is the Corona report, both of which are in the joint appendix, 
is that Harvard actually, even before the Civil War, has at its admissions policy an effort to, in fact, diversify on both viewpoint and geography the class. Now, it is no, there's no doubt, and Harvard acknowledges and is ashamed that in 1920, one of its presidents, President Lowell, decided that there were too many Jews and that they were then going to start asking questions on the application that would allow them to take into effect character. The notion that that bears at all on the way that Harvard's current admissions process, which uses a 40-person admissions committee that meets and decides each application on banc in discussion, has any resemblance whatsoever to the racist, anti-Semitic policy of a single Harvard president is insubstantial, as the courts found. Okay, how do you respond then to, uh, again, we have many briefs on this point from Asian American applicants um, who have, um, and, and it, 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 they say there's an entire industry to help them appear less Asian on their college applications, and that they consider elite colleges to have Asian quotas, effectively, if not in name? I'll say two things. One, generally about the amicus briefs, and two, specifically about Harvard. And I, I certainly want to get to number two. But there are multiple amicus briefs filed by Asian American organizations, and one that is particularly, I think, powerful, filed by 1,240 scholars of Asian American experience and Asian ethnicity, all of whom not only opine but cite studies showing that Asian Americans as a group, and Asia of course represents 61 percent of the world's population and a multiplicity of ethnicities, that Asian Americans bene demonstrably benefit from hol a holistic admissions policy that considers race as one factor among many. Now, with respect to Harvard, there was, to say that there was evidence in this case is quite an understatement. The district court found, I'm citing, I'm quoting page 261 of the joint appendix, and it's reiterated by the Court of Appeals on page 80 of the joint appendix, that there was, quote, no evidence of discrimination against Asian Americans whatsoever. Again, now on page 264, there was consistent, unambiguous, and convincing testimony that there was no discrimination in the administration pro administrative admissions process in general and the personal rating in particular. The, the plaintiffs in this case could not, after four years of discovery, in which they hand-picked applications to view in total. They could not produce a single witness to testify that he or she had been discriminated well, Mr. against. <clears throat> Mr. Waxman, let me stop you there, because you referred to the personal score. And that's a score that Harvard gives based on character traits such as integrity, courage, kindness, and empathy. But the record shows that Asian student applicants get the lowest personal scores of any other group. What accounts for that? Is it, it, it has to be one of two things. It has to be that they really do lack integrity, courage, kindness, and empathy to the same degree as students of other races. Or there has to be something wrong with this personal score. That's, that is, I mean, I, I want to get to what the evidence was there, but that, that syllogism, with all due respect, is wrong. There was, for example, a study that was done in 1983 that looked at why it was that female applicants to graduate school at the University of No, Colorado. just address this. The personal okay, here's score that's given to Asian applicants to Harvard, why, do they, why are they given a lower score than any other group? Okay, so the answer to why they, as a group, why there is a slight numerical disparity with respect to the personal rating of Asian Americans, but, and also a slight numerical disparity to the advantage of Asian Americans with respect to the extracurricular rating and the academic rating was the answer that 
their expert gave with respect to the latter two, which is that the only way that you can, the only model that can be created to figure out what was going into the personal rating couldn't look at almost anything that admissions officers look at in those ratings. It can't, there's no way that it could model what the guidance counselor letters said, what the teacher letters said, what the essays said, what the interviewers letters said. In other words, I thought what the they interviewers did not rate the applicants lower than other, uh, than other applicants based on race. There, there was not the disparity in what was done by what was said by the interviewers. The, with respect to the alumni interviewers, the alumni based interviewers. on based on the subset that was included here, the, their subset, by the way, excluded all ALDC applicants. That is, even though they acknowledged that there was not only no evidence of discrimination against Asian American ALDCs, but they did better. They eliminated from their their model. Applicants that represent, on average, 30 percent of the admitted I, class. I, I still, putting aside the, the teacher recommendations or guidance counselor recommendations, which I'll come to, I still haven't heard any explanation for the disparity between the personal scores that are given to Asians. They rank below whites, they rank way below Hispanics, and really way below African Americans. What and you're talking about? Hundreds and hundreds of applicants, maybe thousands. What is the explanation for that? So the explanation that was, I can't do better than the findings of fact in the trial court as affirmed, and, and, I, and I, but I want to make two points very clear with respect to your question. We, all of this evidence was, all of this was on display and in front of the trial court for, <laughs> this Asian American part of it for well more than a week, maybe two weeks. The district court found, considering all of the evidence, that there is, quote, no credible evidence that corroborates the improper discrimination suggested by SFFA's interpretation of the personal rating. Page well, 264. Well, all right, I'll try one more time. The district court found, quote, a statistically significant and negative relationship between Asian American identity and the personal rating assigned by Harvard admissions officers. That's correct. And what she said is the record will not allow a full explanation for, of that because it, the, the, this, this, there is, there was no evidence with respect to what teachers said, what guidance counselors said, what these students wrote, wrote about. But what we can say with respect to the allegation of discrimination in this case, which was the, the, the definition of discrimination that was at issue in Bakke and Grutter and Fisher and which their expert, which their lawyer got up at opening statement and said, when we talk about discrimination, in this case, we're talking about discrimination in admissions outcomes. And here again, the district court found and the Court of Appeals also concluded that there was no evidence of discrimination in admissions outcomes against Asian if Americans, you whatever you think about the personal rating, which is, after all, simply a number Justice. that... Justice Alito would like to ask a question. I'm sorry. Go I'm ahead. not trying to filibuster you. Uh, finish, your, finish your sentence. Okay. I will ask one more question. I just, I, I want to make one other thing clear to the extent that it's not clear from the record. The personal rating, like the academic rating and the extracurricular rating and the athletic rating, is a number that is put down by a, quote, first reader. That is, the file comes in, it's not usually complete, and just as a matter of triage, one of the 40 admissions officers goes through and gives these numerical numbers. It is, the testimony was, it is not considered in any way once the subcommittees and committees meet. It, quote, fades into the background. It is not the basis of admissions decisions. And so not only did the court find as fact that those, that, that slight disparity was not evidence of discrimination, even in the personal rating. It had a snow effect with respect to outcomes. It makes no difference whatsoever? It's, it doesn't it's affect. not that it makes no difference whatsoever. Look at what the expert testimony was, and I, I realize we're- Does we're, it make a difference or doesn't it make a difference? 
it doesn't make a statistical difference in admissions then, outcomes. Then why do you do both it? courts then, why do you do it? We, I said, it I mean, it doesn't matter. As, why do you do it? We do it as a matter of triage. Right now, Harvard is getting, last year got 61,000 applications for 1,600 slots. And it is an entirely rational way of figuring out where, how you are going to allocate your attention to ask an admissions officer as the file is being developed, just go through in a very rough way and rate a particular application based on what you can see on these four metrics. The fact that Asian Americans got a marginally, on average, a marginally lower personal rating score is no more evidence of discrimination against them than the fact that they got a marginally higher rating than any data can show on academics and extracurriculars. It doesn't mean that they're either smarter or people think they're smarter. Thank you, counsel. Uh, uh, <clears throat> we'll get to you in a moment. Um, <clears throat> there's been a lot of talk about African-American applicants to Harvard in sort of a general uh, uh, indistinguishable way, when in fact they cover a very broad swath of, of applicants. Of course. Um, what do you do uh, with respect to uh, an African-American applicant? I mean, you're concerned about diversity of viewpoint. Let's say his viewpoints tend to be very close to, uh, you know, the white applicants. He grew up in Gross Point, uh, you know, had a great upbringing, comfortable. His parents went to Harvard. He's a legacy. And yet, under your system, when he checks African American, he gets a, a tip. He gets a, a benefit from that. Isn't so, that isn't that very stereotypical on, under the Harvard program? I, I think it's it's well. First of all, it is simply not the case that every every black applicant gets a quote tip. In fact, I'll direct the court's attention to page one thousand eight hundred and eleven of the joint appendix, which includes this beautiful chart which represents an undisputed model of the relative importance of race on application outcomes. And the one that you cannot actually even see to your far right is race. Race explains. I can't see it because it's far away. It, I, I mean, <laughs> nonetheless, you have it to is not reference. zero. It is very close to zero. That is, the testimony in the case well, was. Well, so there's only a little racial discrimination in the no, case. Are you asking me whether Harvard is, you're asking me to answer a question that assumes that Harvard is discriminating on the basis of race? No, I can't accept that. Well, what Harvard isn't that, says isn't that is, what is, Mr. Waxman, isn't that what the case is about, the discrimination against Asian Americans? There was a, count one of the complaint was that Harvard was intentionally discriminating against Asian Americans. The, the entire evidence of that case all of the plaintiff's proof was that Asian Americans are treated worse than white applicants. That is, that there was prejudice, intentional discrimination. That could not, the evidence could not more soundly have refuted that. What do you do with the charts? What do you do with the charts in their brief? I think they're on page 24, 24. or 43, the academic uh, uh, decile and the comparative treatment of uh, African Americans, uh, Hispanics, and Asian Americans. You don't see a surprising disparity in that? So uh, there's a lot to be said about that, but I guess the first thing I would say about that chart is that their own expert agreed that because that chart is simply a descriptive statistic, it is, quote, not equal to evidence of discrimination. It reflects a pattern which might or might not be real. Now understand that that chart that they've displayed for you they have eliminated all ALDC applicants. So one third of the admitted class over six years, they're not even in that chart. They have all, that chart is predicated on something called an academic index. An academic index is a formula that looks at two things, high school grades and test scores. And the so academic people in, in the different racial categories, uh, uh, they have a different result based on other factors, which include race. They, they have a different result because among the many, many, many characteristics of any particular individual applicant that Harvard considers, one that it does not consider is the academic index. That is the, the very metric that they're displaying for you. Harvard doesn't even use the only, the testimony in the case was the only reason that the academic index is even calculated is because the Ivy League athletic rules, 
require that your recruited athlete class, the, the AA for your, AI for your recruited athlete class, not be more than two standard deviations below okay, the Mr. matriculating Waxman, class aside, last year. Put aside the hypothetical about the African-American applicant who's a legacy. Take two African-American applicants in the same category, however you want to take it. Uh, they both get, or both can get, a tip, right, based on their race. And yet, they may have entirely different views. Some of their views may contribute to diversity from the perspective of Asians or whites. Some of them may not. And yet, it's true that they're eligible for the same increase uh, in their opportunities for admission based solely on their skin color. So, the, the point That was a question. No, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm attempting to answer your question. There is no doubt that for, as the testimony showed, that for applicants who are essentially so strong on multiple dimensions, so extraordinarily strong on multiple dimensions, that they are sort of on the bubble, that they might, they are a real candidate for admission. African Amer being African American, or being Hispanic, or in some instances being Asian American, can provide one of many, many tips that will well, put people you People say in. that, yes, but you will have to concede that if it provides one of many, then in some cases it will be determined. I do. I do concede okay, that. Okay, so we're talking that, about race as a determining factor in admission to Harvard. Race in some, for some highly qualified applicants can be the determinative factor just as being the, a, you know, an oboe player in a year in which the Harvard Radcliffe Orchestra needs an oboe player will yeah, be the tip. We did not fight a civil war about oboe players. I, we did fight a civil war to eliminate racial discrimination, and that's why it's a matter of, of, of considerable concern. And I think it's important to, for you to establish whether or not granting a credit based solely on skin color is based on a stereotype when you say this brings diversity of viewpoint. It may not bring diversity of viewpoint, viewpoint in a particular case at all. Well, number one, viewpoint diversity, while Harvard values it and seeks it, is not the only, is by, by far the only reason for wanting a genuinely diverse class. We want a diverse class for backgrounds and interests and lots of things other than just viewpoint. If we were to use, for example, the, the, the example that has been discussed, I believe, for every other advocate that has stood up this morning, you know, and ask, what about taking race into account if the student writes about it? The fact of the matter is Harvard is attempting not to have among, it, among a class of, that is diverse among many generations, a class that is racially diverse only for people for whom their racial identity and their racial experiences is of such compelling importance that they write about it. Right? The, the, your hypothetical about the black student who may have very different views than the stereotypical, the stereotype of what a black student will have was in fact, is in fact the subject of the, that's discussed in the Corona report. The Corona report gave in its analysis of the importance and dimensions of diversity an actual example that came from Richard Light's book, uh, published book, which had a particular class. It happened to have three African-American students in it. An African-American student gave an answer in a discussion, which another African-American student said, that is not my view. My view is quite the opposite. And a third one said, I wasn't actually going to say anything, but I have a completely different view. That was an incredible learning experience, not only for the non-African Americans in the discussion, but for them. And Thank that's you. what Harvard is trying to get at. Thank I'm you, sorry Mr. for Expert. taking I, so long. No, no, to I get appreciate that. your answers. Justice Thomas? Justice Alito? In, uh, in Baki, uh, Justice Powell chose Harvard's admission program as a model. And that selection has had an enormous effect for the last 50 years, <clears throat> Harvard submitted a brief in Baki along with a number of other colleges. I went back and I looked at it and uh, noticed that the brief talked about Harvard's program going back 30 years, but it didn't say anything 
about President Lowell or what Harvard had done back in the 1920s. So my question is, did Harvard sell Justice Powell a bill of goods? Do you think Justice Powell would have championed, would have held up the Harvard program as a model, uh, as an exemplar for the whole country, if he knew about the origins of the holistic program? Justice Powell used, the Har used Harvard's description about its admissions process and the limited extent to which it was then and for the past 30 years had been using race as one factor among many to achieve genuine diversity in its student body. Harvard, the Harvard brief, Justice Powell didn't t take it or not take it because prior to the Civil War, Harvard College was a leader in encouraging diversity in its undergraduate applications any more than the fact that it had a terrible stain on its history a hundred years ago. It was taken for what it was presented as, and it was what it was, and it fairly presented how the Harvard admissions process worked then and works now. Justice Sotomayor. Counsel, um, there are two questions that I want to get to that were asked of you. The first was Justice Alito's about the poor personal uh, rating. Um, it seems to me. Um, that petitioner claims that Harvard's discriminating against Asian Americans because it uses subjective criteria that's affecting the personnel ratings. That's how I think I read his question, correct? So it's not that it's using race in admitting people, it's that it's using a corrupted personnel rating, correct? Well, I don't want to speak for Justice, I don't want to presume to speak for Justice Alito. I, I think it is, it is fair to say that the criticism of the, this, the personal rating right. relates to the, quote, subjectivity that is involved really in all of the ratings, but particularly in the personal rating. Well, it goes, it, the uh, evaluations that use words like not a non-leader, not caring, not whatever. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It applies to all races, correct? Of course. All races, uh, applicants receive those ratings as well, correct? And I think right. what the expert was saying, the fact that you have these numbers, uh, standing alone don't tell you anything, correct? You have to look at all the input that goes into why. Correct. Correct. Wh whether there was discrimination or not, correct? Correct. All right. So the numbers alone tell you nothing. That's, that's right. The numbers can tell you. You, could, you can tote up 100,000 applications and look at what the first reader said, scored and measure it against declared race and come up with a feature that says, gee, across these 150,000, or in this case, 150,000 minus all the ALDCs, it looks like you know, on average, Asian American, self-declared Asian Americans have this number and self-declared whites have this number. It tells you nothing about why that number was given any more and than there, why. There, and I don't want to cut you off, but I want to get no, you. I, I, and so I it doesn't tell off. you why, and there was no proof to show why. This report found that that number did not prove discrimination. Correct? There was actual proof that it did not reflect discrimination. There was a multi, there was expert analysis on, on, on multidimensionality and that looked at the non-academic index that showed that, for example, white applicants who got a one or a two on academics and Asian Americans who got one or two on academics for whatever reason, the latter group got lower teacher ratings than the former. And same with guidance counselor ratings. It doesn't tell you why, it doesn't permit, and it certainly doesn't permit an inference that Harvard is discriminating. The, the district court could not have been more definitive about the absence of any racial discrimination or discrimination against Asian Americans than it was.
uh, finding that the Office of Civil Rights in the early 19, in, in, in 1990 also found. All right, could you deal with Stimulation D? I think that you were trying to explain why the district court rejected that stimulation. Uh, stimulation. Simulation. Simulation, I'm sorry, simulation. Um, numbers as meaningful. Could you finish your answer? Yes, and you know, in particular, I'll you know, I'll I'll point the court to because I'm not going to be able to do it as well as the district court uh, to pages 208 to 220 of the joint appendix, which is the district court's findings on this, and 73 to 79, um, which is the court of appeals, and. 1307 to 1325, which is the Smith Committee's analysis of this. But basically, what the district court found was, as I said, that Simulation D would require significant sacrifices, I don't have the quote right in front of me now, on almost every dimension that Harvard values, including a substantial decline. We're not talking about as a decline in SAT scores are going from the 99th percentile to the 98th percentile. We're talking about the following things that the court found. The, uh, the percentage of matri the matriculating class that would be academic ones or twos would go down by 17%. Every other factor would go down by at least 10%, between 10 and 22%. The number of, app of matriculants <laughs> interested in majoring in the humanities, which is a major tip that Harvard gives because of Harvard's recent inability to matriculate excellent students who want to major in the humanities, would go down by 14%. The number of African Americans admitted would go down from 14 to 10%. It was the whole confluence of all of those consequences that led the district court to confirm that it was not a workable, effective, race-neutral alternative. Well, it seems that for Justice Gorsuch, none of those other things are compelling interests. And how do we well, respond to that? He would well, say, I, I'm it's not nice sure I'm you. ascribing that to Justice Gorsuch. But. Well, I, I, but he seemed to say an art museum is not important. So if the matrix shows that those interested in the arts falls to falls dramatically. That might be of concern to Harvard. I think it is it, valuable. It might very well be a concern. Would it would it lead would it lead a judge skeptically applying strict scrutiny to say, oh, it just doesn't work. You're not gonna have an art museum or you're not gonna have a squash team or you're not gonna have you know alumni contributions. It, it wasn't any of those things. It's a caricature to say that those were the reasons why this particular thing wasn't a race-neutral alternative. Now, I just want to say, if you think, notwithstanding the findings, that the district court and the court of appeals didn't properly apply the kind of strict scrutiny and narrow tailoring analysis that it should have, okay, that's a remand. I don't think the record will bear that out. It is not a reason to dispense with decades of constitutional precedent that has allowed all of these, what this court has properly considered to be a compelling national interest in having this kind of learning environment. Thank you. Justice Kagan? Uh, Mr. Waxman, there have been a lot of questions today, and I take these to be important questions about what is the end point. Um, if if we can d achieve racial diversity through neutral mechanisms rather than through race conscious mechanisms, we should. We've said that many times. So the question is, when can we say that we can achieve our racial diversity goals in that way? And I guess I have a two-part question and, and then an assumption that I want you to bake into the two parts. The first is, what is Harvard doing in an ongoing way to test whether that is true? And the second is, does Harvard see any progress along that dimension? In other words, I think it was said by petitioners' counsel, oh, Harvard is doing, you know, is putting as, is, uh, is, is, is using as great a preference as it ever did. And the question is, over time, has Harvard found 
that it has become less necessary to use race conscious uh, means or not. Here's the th assumption that I want to have you baked into this, which is I take petitioners to be saying, and I think that this is an important thing, that uh, it doesn't matter if some part of the reason for adopting race neutral approaches is to achieve racial diversity. I think that they very clearly said that. I'm not sure I understand why, given their legal arguments, but I think that they very clearly said that. So assume that you can, you know, sit down and say, we're, 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 we're trying to figure out what race neutral mechanisms to use, and part of the goal is to achieve racial diversity. What is Harvard doing to answer that question, and is it any closer? I have firmly in mind the second part of your question. If I don't also answer the first, please remind me. The evidence in the case is that for decades, Harvard has been taking steps other than the conscious, uh, other than race consciousness to increase the level of diversity, including ethnic and racial diversity. And these are discussed actually in the Smith Committee report and, uh, and Dean Smith's testimony and in the findings. It, for example, in the wake of Grutter and actually before, substantially increased the amount of resources that it put in outreach in partnering with organizations that um, that assist and you know advance the educational potential of minority and low socioeconomic students. It has it has achieved some success in 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 getting additional applications, not just from minorities, but from minority applicants who are actually really qualified to attend Harvard. It thought about well, maybe a way to increase this is to substantially increase our financial aid. And the, there's evidence in the case, there's actually a beautiful chart that shows how the level of financial aid went up at various points over two decades, and what happened with respect to the racial diversity of the applicant class and the matriculating class, and what the testimony showed and the findings was it made a difference to a point. After a certain point, it no longer made any difference. Harvard tested the proposition that its early action program, it's, it's not early decision the way that most schools are because you're not committed to it, but that by admitting a significant percentage, I don't know, 20 or 25 percent of its class for people who applied you know, early, early on in the academic year, it was disadvantaging minority applicants and applicants from low socioeconomic circumstances because they didn't have the kind of resources, guidance counselors and test prep and all that sort of stuff to be able to take advantage of it. They, they, they ended it and asked other universities to do the same thing with two exceptions no one else did. And what they found at the end of five years was that it had the opposite result. That is, it made it more difficult for them to recruit and matriculate underrepresented minorities. And there were there were a bunch of other things in the record about things that Harvard has done, some of which have had substantial success. And so the notion that Harvard is doing things the same way and is always going to do the same things the same way is just wrong. Harvard is Harvard completely recognizes and endorses this court's statement in Grutter that quote, there are serious problems of justice connected with the idea of preference itself. That's why it holds itself, why it is attempting to achieve all of the compelling benefits of, of a genuinely diverse student body in the most race neutral way that it can. And in terms of, I don't know if this is the first part of your question, but Harvard is actually attempt is measuring how it is doing in terms of diversity and the benefits of diversity and what needs to be done and what other things can be done in a race neutral way on a very regular basis. And I, I can give you the data on, 
you know, with respect to either. But for example, Harvard, there is a, <laughs> Harvard said, committed itself in 2018 that it would, you know, continue to look for race neutral alternatives and have another systematic review, uh, you know, systematic, statistically, you know, rigorous review about how it is doing. That committee has been formed and has already met for the five years that will, you know, that will transpire next year. Yes, we are trying. Yes, we have tried other things that have helped. Are we there yet? No, and that's the reason why the 45%, the district court's finding of 45%, that's what it shows. It Thank shows. You. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. Ms. Uh, Justice uh, Gorsuch. Yeah, I, I just uh, was hoping to get an answer to the second half of the question, which oh, was okay. when, when does Harvard anticipate uh, this will end. Uh, yep. Grutter spoke of it being a 25-year window, as you're well aware. Harvard could tomorrow do without federal funds and continue to discriminate on the basis of race however it pleased. Um, I'm sure that would be a hardship. But uh, wh 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 what, is, what is Harvard's view on how long this will take? So Harvard, like the Solicitor General and like UNC, understood all four paragraphs of what Justice O'Connor wrote in her opinion and takes it to heart. What Justice O'Connor said was, it's been 25 years since Grutter. There's evidence that our society is changing. It is, we expect that 25 years from now, the use of racial preferences will no longer be necessary. So Harvard agrees with that? And does Harvard agree with that? I don't, I, Harvard does not currently, based on its data, expect that in 2028, it will have been able to use a only race-neutral alternative. So, so, so what this, so but what, what I do what agree are, with, what if, are I, Harvard's, if I may. I'm, I'm just, I'm just, it just, it's a real simple question. If Harvard doesn't have an answer, that's fine. But does Harvard have some view about when? Harvard, yes, Harvard's view about when doesn't have a date on it. Harvard takes to heart Justice O'Connor's opinion that, quote, in the context of higher education, the durational requirement can be met by periodic reviews to determine whether racial preferences are still necessary okay. to achieve student body diversity. And we want to be put to that strict scrutiny test. Thank you. Justice Kavanaugh. I do have uh, two or three questions. First, you're seeking educational diversity, uh, as I understand it, uh, at Harvard. But my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is that uh, you don't ask about uh, religion and why the disparate treatment of religion and race when uh, would evangelical Christians, Catholics, Muslims add to the educational diversity uh, at Harvard and other religious groups um, add to the diversity and why, why not ask about that? So Harvard um, greatly values religious diversity. It is extraordinarily proud of the religious diversity. How me, can it track it if it doesn't ask about Oh, how can it track it? How can it Har track it in the admissions process may happen by happenstance? I'll let you finish. Har okay, Harvard is not tracking it in the admissions process other than to the extent that, and, and many, many students indicate what their religion is. Harvard, tr Harvard has not provided, thought it necessary, and so far as I know, Nobody has suggested that Harvard has any need to provide a tip for religious diversity because the Harvard undergraduate population is so religiously diverse. There are currently 47 um, that answers chaplains. My, that answers my question. I yeah. Okay. That I, I just, I just, I just want to say that our ministry minister, ministers to 27 different religious denominations. Right. It was a factual question. Uh, second. Uh, I think you agree that the baseline in our precedents, operating within the confines of our precedents, as you want us to do, uh, is race neutrality. And uh, we've allowed, though, limited consideration of race in educational and higher educational admissions, uh, as you've heard, uh, two limits on that, uh, as I understand it. One, the adequate race neutral alternatives. Two, the durational limits, the 25 years or whatever durational limit you think. Uh, works there. I just want to make, <clears throat> make sure you agree with how I set that up. In other words, race neutrality is the baseline. There are two limits on the consideration of race-conscious educational admissions at colleges and universities. 
adequate race neutral alternatives would be one. A durational limit, 25 or something else, would be the other. Is that how you read our precedents? I not? read your precedent in that I think you have other requirements too, which is it has to be flexible, it has to be one factor among many, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Right. But with res the only, I agree with your two categorizations, except that with respect to the durational requirements, we understand it to be the, the, the in, consistent with the language from Justice O'Connor's opinion that I quoted the court, okay. which is that the narrow tailoring requirement and the race neutral alternative requirement strictly scrupulously and skeptically applied will tell us when race neutral alternative. Okay, and one last one. Um, this picks up on Justice Kagan's and Justice Gorsuch's questions, I believe. <clears throat> but on the adequate race neutral alternatives question, it seems that Harvard would have to sacrifice potentially something else to achieve what you think would be meaningful, sufficient racial diversity. And I think the questions, Justice Gorsuch, were, well, why don't you have to then sacrifice those something else's to achieve the, uh, if you're going to um, uh, otherwise use race conscious means? And there's no question that. <clears throat> In other words, we, I think that's a legal question we're going to have to ultimately figure out. Does a university have to sacrifice those other things? or not. And so what this court's precedents say, you know, Bakke, Grutter, and Fisher are, of course, race, you know, there are race neutral alternatives that may require some sacrifices. A university is not required to sacrifice, you know, so much that it changes the essential character. I, I, I wish I had the, this court's own words, but I think that's the test, and that was certainly the test the district court applied. That that's suffices, and you answered it. Thank you. Thank you. Justice Barrett. <sighs> Mr. Waxman, this is not a question about Harvard's history of anti-Semitism, but I do want to go back to the um, opinion in Bakke and Justice Powell's holding up Har Harvard's application process as a model. And then Justice O'Connor and Grutter again referred back to Harvard's admissions process. And I want to know whether Harvard's admissions process has meaningfully changed from the time that Justice Powell held it up. I mean, what Justice Powell found attractive about it, what Justice O'Connor endorsed, was the holistic aspect of it, and that race can be used as a tip. In its essence, is it the same? Yes, race can be used as a tip, as one of many, many, many tips in an effort to achieve diversity that is across many, many dimensions beyond ethnic. And, and so in the way that Harvard thinks about its admissions process, it is the same now as it was in Bakke. Yes, Harvard is, can I just give yeah, one, oh, a one sentence sure. explication yeah. of that? What the Harvard Admissions Committee is attempting to do with the benefit, the luxury of a pool of applicants that is supremely qualified is to bring together a class of 1,600 matriculants who are best in the judgment of the admissions committee and the faculty that oversees it, are best able to learn from and teach each other as an organic whole. So my question is, we've been talking a lot about endpoint, but my question is, so Baki was, you know, almost 50 years ago now, if Harvard's admissions process is essentially the same in the way that it accounts for race and thinking about endpoints. And I, I recognize and you describe some of the things that Harvard is doing to try to recruit more minority applicants, but why are we to think that there will be an endpoint? And Grutter's pretty insistent. I mean, Grutter says the requirement that all race conscious admissions programs have a termination point. Um, so there has to be one. And if it really hasn't changed much since Bakke. So the system that is, we're taking race into account as one factor among many. Obviously, the extent to which race is, race qua race is a factor, is dependent on the extent to which so called race neutral alternatives have already helped Harvard to matriculate a class that is diverse along this dimension and others. And 
Harvard does track its progress in this regard and accommodate the admissions process. For example, in terms of where we are, when will we get there? You know, the, the record contains, you know, any number, the, a faculty committee study, a working group, a task force, all of which made reports about this, but it also annually does a comprehensive survey of its graduating seniors and asks them questions that go to this. And the, the survey and the record on the benefit side, to I think to Harvard's great satisfaction, showed that two thirds of all of the seniors said that their Harvard experience strengthened their ability to relate to people of different ration, races, nations, and religions, and 70% said that Harvard's experience had led them to seriously question or rethink their beliefs about a race or ethnic group different than their own. But that's that showing is, the educational benefits of diversity, right? And it shows, right. That, it shows that in terms of are we there yet, you know, we're not going to achieve 100%. Honestly, 70% is pretty darn good. And it would not have been, at the time that Harvard wrote its brief, in the Bakke case, and at the time that Grutter was decided, those were not the statistics. So you think you're getting closer to a termination point? I, we are very definitely getting closer to a termination point, both in terms of engineering race-neutral alternatives, but also achieving a class that is diverse across religious, viewpoint, racial, ethnic, um, you know, academic, political, you know, yes, we are, we, we are proud of the progress we made. As Dean Smith said, we still have work to do, including with respect to the way in which we treat students and allow students to interact with each other once they get here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. General Prelogger, welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. The court has heard hours of argument on the constitutional issues in this case, and so I would like to take a step back and focus on the profound consequences of the court's decision here for the nation that we are and the nation that we aspire to be. Petitioner seeks a sweeping ruling that would harm students at schools and colleges throughout the nation. A blanket ban on race-conscious admissions would cause racial diversity to plummet at many of our nation's leading educational institutions. Race-neutral alternatives right now can't make up the difference, so all students at those schools would be denied the benefits of learning in a diverse educational environment. And because college is the training ground for America's future leaders, the negative consequences would have reverberations throughout just about every important institution in America. For the United States military, as I've explained, having a diverse officer corps is a critical national security imperative. For corporate America, diversity is essential to business solutions. For the medical community and scientific researchers, diversity is an essential element of innovation and delivering better health outcomes. Overruling Grutter would have devastating effects on our nation's efforts to move ever closer to a more perfect union where our nation's diversity is a source of its greatest strength. And I think the court should not take the destabilizing step of overruling precedent here. Justice Gorsuch, you asked a series of questions about race-neutral alternatives, and I want to offer the position of the United States. I think, Justice Barrett, you also asked these questions about things like legacy, uh, donors, children and faculty and staff. And I want to be very clear on behalf of the United States that if it could be shown that eliminating those kinds of preferences would actually enable a university to meet its, its diversity goals and to be able to offer the educational benefits of a diverse student body, then yes, we think absolutely that can function as a race-neutral alternative. And it's incumbent on universities to consider those kinds of options as they chart a path forward. And so I think to, to the extent that the court has any concerns about that or thinks that the lower court in this case did not apply that kind of standard, that would be wrong because the court has made clear that strict scrutiny 
in this context is strict and that universities have to undertake continual obligations to search for those types of alternatives in order to be able to achieve diverse student enrollment without taking race into account. Greta was about college admissions, but in your opening statement, it seemed to me you want to extend it to employment. Is that right? No, Justice Alito, I was trying to make the observation that the experience of students in those four years of college have effects on the course of their life. Then why were you talking about corporate America? Because corporate America, like the United States military, relies on having a diverse pipeline of individuals who had the experience of learning in a diverse educational environment and who themselves reflect the diversity of the American population. We're not asking the court to extend Grutter in any way here. We're only asking the court to reject petitioner's request for the court to overrule that precedent because I think it would have these destabilizing ramifications in just about every important industry in America. General, if we were talking about the 25 year mark, so let's imagine we fast forward and it's you know five years from now and we're considering whether to, um, same question, would it be overruling Grutter at that point to say this is the end point, we're at 25 years, no more race consciousness in admissions? I think it would if this court based that decision on the nature of the compelling interest here. I just don't think it's a tenable way to read Grutter to say that the court was suggesting that 25 years from now, poof, the interest in diversity in higher education is no longer compelling. That is and will remain a compelling interest. And Grutter observed that over time, it would be possible for schools and universities to achieve that interest without having to take race into account. And I understand the concerns, Justice Barrett, that you've raised. Justice Kavanaugh that you've raised about the fact that the arc of progress in society has perhaps been slower than the Grutter court imagined. I think if this court has those concerns, it could emphasize that the narrow tailoring requirement remains very strict in this case. Universities should be held to a high standard and a heavy burden to explore those alternatives, to put into practice the race neutral uh, alternatives that currently exist, and to try to get to the point that the Grutter court imagined and that we will eventually reach as a nation where it is no longer necessary to take race into account. But what if the structural barriers, I mean, there's not a remedial justification on the table here. Our precedents rule that out. What if the structural barriers just make it impossible 25 years from now um, to sit here and say that without race conscious admissions, you know, especially if Harvard wants to keep everything exactly the same with respect to its other metrics like SAT scores, not dropping at all, and, and the museum and the squash team and all of that stuff. Um, what if it's just impossible? Um, and so what if Grutter was grossly optimistic in what it thought was achievable? And perhaps, you know, Grutter, as we've talked about earlier in the argument, emphasized the risky and potentially poisonous nature of race classifications. Um, what if there's no end point? I mean, could we still say that there's a compelling interest in the educational benefit of a diverse classroom if it comes at the cost of something that Grutter itself recognized was very dangerous and corrosive to society? I do think that yes, the compelling interest would still exist there. I recognize the force of the point that there are structural barriers that can impede progress, but I think it would be wrong to suggest that those barriers are going to exist in perpetuity in all places and with respect to all schools. The states are not similarly situated in this regard. There are nine states, as petitioners emphasize, that have barred the use of race in college admissions, and many of the universities and colleges in those states have been able still to achieve enrollment of diverse student bodies. And I think that it's incumbent on, on every college and university around the nation to study from and learn from those examples. And it's not accurate to say that uh, if we look forward into the future in 25 years, still at all places throughout the nation, it will be necessary to have race conscious admissions. But I do want to be responsive as well to the point that, that you made about resisting any changes whatsoever and be clear again on behalf of the United States that we do not think that a university could reject a race neutral alternative because it would would have those kinds of modest impacts on things like SAT scores. I think that that can clearly be the kind of thing that would qualify as a viable or workable race neutral alternative. And if the court has any concerns that lower courts are not applying that stringent standard, then I would urge the court to make that clear in a decision and, and provide guidance going forward. I think that's a very important what you just said. Um, so you're saying 
uh, an adequate race neutral alternative, uh, it would be uh, permissible for the court to say that uh, you have to eliminate things like legacy children of donors uh, if you could uh, obtain a sufficient uh, meet its diversity goals, uh, was your word, uh, by doing so and doing race neutral admissions. Do I have that correct? Yes, that's exactly right, Justice Kavanaugh. And I think that that flows directly from this court's But I'm emphasis. sorry, at what point does that become dramatic? Harvard won't be Harvard if it drops from 2,200 to 500. Yes, and I was speaking. And, and or there is a point at which a change is significant or insignificant. Mm -hmm. I agree, Justice Sotomayor, and I think that the, the lines that the court has drawn in this context, context flow from Grutter itself, where the court made clear that a university doesn't have to sacrifice its reputation for academic excellence. In other words, it doesn't have to accept those kinds of dramatic changes to the academic quality of the incoming student class. I was speaking well, to- Well, your adversary in Simulation D says the change was only from it was less than a 40-point change, and so he says that's insignificant. Why do you think his point is not valid? I don't With respect to Simulation D, uh, in particular, it wasn't just changes to SAT scores. I think the most substantial reason that the district court rejected that as a workable alternative here is because it would have had a precipitous decline in the number of African-American students. They would fall by about 30 percent in the enrollment of the class, and that was coupled with the impact on reductions in the number of students who had the highest academic and extracurricular ratings who could then be admitted in the class. But I, I So don't you're sacrificing the essence of Harvard, academic Excellence. That was what the district court found with respect to simulation D. But, you know, I, I guess I would say I think that that was a, a factual finding in this case. The First Circuit affirmed it. But as Mr. Waxman said, if you do not think the district court applied the right stringent standard in evaluating that as a race neutral alternative, then that is a basis to send this case back because we agree that strict scrutiny is strict in this context. The other side points to the examples, as you've heard, throughout of California and Washington, Michigan and Florida and other states, and says, <clears throat> well, if they just put their uh, effort to it, they will be able to uh, use race-neutral alternatives and still be able to achieve uh, its diversity goals. I'm going to bracket the f fact that its diversity goals is still pretty vague, but we talked about that in the last case, but um, would still be able to do so. Um, do you want to respond to that? So as I was saying to Justice Barrett, I do think it's the case that there are some states and certainly some institutions today that can fully achieve a diverse student body without needing to take race into account. With respect to California and Michigan in particular, since your question referred to them, I would point the court to the amicus brief filed by those university systems in those states which have explained that actually they have struggled despite implementing any number of race neutral alternatives to actually see true diversity across all of their campuses including their most selective campuses. And University of California in particular points to Berkeley and UCLA as places where there have been these dramatic declines in diversity, racial diversity on campus. I, I guess this will be repetitive, but you've said true diversity, meet its diversity goals. You know, I'm not sure exactly what that means, and that's a, I mean, we're going to have to figure that out, I guess. Um, but uh, without any more precise guidance on what exactly meet its diversity goals means as to numbers, it's a little hard to assess, I think. Well, let me try to be more precise. Um, I think that the relevant compelling interest here comes directly from Grutter, where the court recognized that it is student body diversity in all of its many manifestations. The court has made clear it's not simple ethnic or racial diversity, and that's what creates a lot of the guardrails in this area in terms of no racial quotas, no automatic awards of points, no separate set-asides or separate admissions tracks. Um, the nature of the interest is not in achieving a precise numerical threshold of minority enrollment at a particular university. Instead, the court has defined this as the educational goals that derive from having a diverse student body along multiple dimensions, and that is the, the ultimate aim of these policies. So, so a university that, that did use a, a, a numerical goal or did grant a, a tip based on race alone would be a problem. Yes, I think if a university used a numerical goal and that functioned as an inflexible um, 
goal for the university or, or functioned as a quota system, that's plainly unconstitutional. This court's precedents don't countenance that. And when, With we, respect when we look at that, um, I'm sorry to interrupt. Okay. Go ahead and finish. I just wanted also to try to be responsive to your point about using race um, as, a, as, as a tip or a preference, and to be clear that there as well, the court has made clear that that can't be mechanical application, so you can't um, preference every single person automatically or inflexibly. Okay. And on, uh, uh, um, but but what, do we, what, what is a court, a lower court, all right? I mean, faced with, you know, diversity um, and very hard standards to apply, supposed to do when a university's admissions data with respect to race looks more or less identical every single year. So I think at that point, the district court needs to probe whether impermissible racial balancing is happening. The court has made clear that that is not appropriate, that the relevant compelling interest here is not in trying to achieve a precise percentage of particular racial or ethnic groups in the class year over year. And so if that kind of evidence existed, then I think it would be incumbent on the university to, to establish that it is not actually engaging in racial balancing. Thank you. I think in this case, wasn't it clear there were variations among the groups? Yes, that's long? exactly right, Justice Sotomayor. And what the district court said with respect to the Harvard facts is that there were uh, greater fluctuations with respect to the number of students in each group who were in admitted year over year than there were fluctuations in the applicant pool of individuals of those particular races. And so the, the district court said that runs completely contrary to a theory of racial balancing in this case. Now, going back to the earlier argument, um, Petitioner's counsel in rebuttal raised Berkeley's figures, and I don't remember it exactly, but it was like a third white, a third Hispanic, a third this. He, at the end, he mentioned a black population that seemed tiny. Um, but how do you deal with answering Justice Kavanaugh's question of what constitutes adequacy? So um, because he seemed to imply your opponent opposing counsel, that, um, that Berkeley was already diverse. It had numbers that were close to the population. Well, Justice Sotomayor, I would point to the brief filed by the University of California system in this case, and they have explained in detail how Berkeley has, has experienced a substantial decline in the African-American student population. I think it's gone down to 3 percent, and they further have explained the toll that's taken on their ability to offer the educational benefits of diversity, as well as the glaring sense of racial isolation that those students have on the Berkeley campus. Thank you, General. Uh, Justice Thomas? Justice Alito? Justice Kate. Uh, General, one of the through lines of the briefs in this case is, I, I think it's, it's actually the first line of the petitioner's brief or something like it, is, um, is essentially uh, Brown compels the overruling of Grutter. And um, the petitioners actually haven't given a whole lot of attention to that argument, but the idea is, and some of the questioning has reflected this, this idea, is that, um, you know, we have this long and horrible history of racial discrimination, and surely that functions here to prevent racial classifications or to prevent race consciousness of the kind that Harvard and UNC are using. And I just thought I'd give you an opportunity to uh, discuss w w what you think of that argument. I think that argument is wrong in just about every respect. There is a world of difference between the situation this court confronted in Brown, the separate but equal doctrine that was designed to exclude African Americans based on notions of racial inferiority and subjugate them, which as this court recognized with school children affected their hearts and minds in a way unlikely ever to be undone. A world of difference between that and the university policies at issue in this case, which are not intended to exclude anyone on the basis of race or, or even to benefit particular racial groups on the basis of race, but rather are designed to bring individuals of all races together so that they can all learn together and benefit from that diverse educational environment. And I think it is profoundly ahistorical to say, as petitioners do, that those situations are precisely equivalent, and it also trivializes the grievous moral and legal wrongs of state-sponsored segregation and the enormous harms that millions of Americans suffered under it. Justice Gorsuch? Um, j just to return to Justice Sotomayor's question to you, um, you indicated, I believe, that, that, that um, 
the percentages have varied dramatically over the years. Um, I must be missing something. Up on page 23 of the petitioner's brief, they have the statistics from Harvard from 2006 through 2018 and, and, and the share of um, Asian American students um, varied three, three, between 17 and 20 percent every year, 70 percent actually being the outlier. Am I missing something? No, Justice Gorsuch, I think that the point I was trying to make is that that band is actually a greater amount of fluctuation than was present in the applicant pool with respect to the number of Asian Americans who were applying to Harvard every year. But, but let me is just say this. the same thing true with the Hispanics and, and African Americans? Because the numbers are pretty similar similarly banded for those. Yes, that's my understanding, that the district court's factual finding in this regard is that there was relative stability with respect to the number of individuals in those groups who were applying and greater fluctuation with respect to admissions decisions. No, these, these, are, these, are, these, these are admitted students I'm talking about here. Yes, and the district court was drawing a comparison between the, the uh, bands that you were just describing and the bands that exist the with The point is, whatever the pool is, every year the percentage is the same. And the U.S. government below said this manifest steadiness speaks for itself. Am I missing something? Well, let me just say that the district court made a factual finding of no racial balancing. But if you think the district court was wrong about that, and this is clearly erroneous, then that is clearly impermissible, and, and the court should send it back. That would provide a basis to reverse on clear error, and we are not here to suggest that racial balancing is okay under this court's precedence. Grutter doesn't countenance it, and the court could make that clear. Thank you. Justice Kavanaugh? I appreciate your statement about Brown. I want to ask um, a question. Justice Thomas's opinion in Grutter said, I agree with the court's holding that racial discrimination in higher education admissions will be illegal in 25 years, end quote. And um, taking that statement, uh, it would seem that extending it beyond 25 years would itself be overruling Grutter. And, um, just want you to have a chance to respond. Is that a, not an accurate characterization of the court's holding in your view, or, or what is your response to that description of what the court did? Variation on questions you've had before, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to address that in particular. I do think uh, that that is not how the court itself understood the language. Uh, the court made clear in the four paragraphs that we've been discussing that the court expected that universities would no longer be able to justify race-conscious admissions policies over time, but that was because the court expected that due to the rate of change in society, they would be able to achieve the benefits of student body diversity without taking race into account. And so I don't think that it's tenable to read the majority opinion in that case as having determined that there was a 25-year clock that would be inflexible. Instead, it was an expectation about how, what changes we would see in society. Thank you. Justice Barrett. Thank you, General. Rebuttal, Mr. Norris. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Just a few points. First, I think what's lost in the United States argument, in Harvard's argument, and in Grutter itself is that racial classifications themselves have harms. They stigmatize their intended beneficiaries. They increase racial consciousness, which delays the day in which we can move to true racial neutrality. And they cause resentment by treating people differently based on something they can't change that's cosmetic and that's irrelevant to their ability to get educational opportunities. The court said that in Adirond. It said it in Shaw. It said it in Croson. Harvard doesn't challenge any of those precedents. Secondly, race neutral alternatives. Uh, there were a few pleas for a remand that I heard from my friends, but it's hard to take those seriously when Harvard thumbed its nose at Grutter for 14 years to not consider race-neutral alternatives one time until three years after we filed a lawsuit against it. I understand Mr. Waxman to say he'll no longer defend his legacy preferences, um, but now what, what, what's at stake in terms of race-neutral alternatives are a decline, a slight decline in profile ratings, which Mr. Waxman said are not that important to the admissions process when he talked about Asian Americans, a three percentage point decline in people who want to major in the humanities. Students change majors like they change socks. I mean, speaking from experience, there will be people who think that they're going to major in the hard sciences and then find themselves majoring in the humanities. That's not the stuff of strict scrutiny. Then we have the four percentage point uh, decline in black admissions. Our expert testified uh, without contradiction that that is an absolute floor, that Harvard could get that number almost to parity if it considered wealth instead of income. And Harvard already sacrifices on all of these metrics in order to meet its racial goals. It should do the same for racial equality. This court made schools close to comply with Brown, as it should have. Harvard should have to sacrifice for the same reasons. 
Lastly, Harvard thankfully does say it is ashamed of its history of Jewish discrimination. I hope someday it says the same about how it's treating Asians. It is undisputed that Harvard, uh, there's a statistically significant relationship between being Asian and getting a low personal rating, which is supposed to measure things like confidence, likability, and kindness. Harvard's witnesses consistently testified that Asians don't deserve lower personal ratings in their experience. Harvard didn't submit a model of the personal rating itself. Um, which means I think they probably did study it and then realized they couldn't get rid of the disparity. Um, and the model, when you take the personal rating out of an admissions model, it shows a statistically significant disparity against Asian Americans in admissions decisions. Now the district court said, uh, I believe Harvard that it doesn't discriminate, but we don't typically let people satisfy strict scrutiny with just their testimony. Mr. Waxman said it's attributable, attributable to unobservables in the model, but unobservables is code for the Asians really deserve it. And that's simply not true. That was not ever supported by any evidence in the record. And we keep saying Asians, these are not Asians, they're not from Asia, these are people who are Americans. They were born in Texas, California, Ohio, Tennessee. They should not be the victims. They were born in 2005, the people who are applying to college now. They should not be the victims of Harvard's racial experimentation. Thank you. Thank you to all counsel in both cases. Cases submitted.